ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome back. Welcome back to CFT um, in this transitional year. Uh, we are here in the wonderful Minerva with our beloved main house uh, getting its facelift. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be back and to see so many familiar faces. Many of you I know came to all the pre-performance talks last year. I'm Kate Moss. Um, I'm a novelist and, as many of you know, wrote the CFT biography. This is a particular pleasure because the beginning of the season, I think for everybody, is that exciting moment of what's this year going to be like. And so to have the very great Richard Eyre opening the season is an enormous pleasure for everybody. And those of you who have not yet seen the show, who's been in to see the pyjama game? Oh, well done. And who's going in tonight? <laughs> and who has not yet got a ticket? <laughs> OK, that's fine. <laughs> um, in time on a tradition, um, it's one of those shabby cliches to say that somebody needs no introduction. But I think in this case it is really true um, that Richard Eyre needs no introduction. I will just say a couple of things. I will say many of David Hare's newest plays, uh, Tom Stoppard's plays, Guys and Dolls, Hamlet, Richard III, Notes on a Scandal, Iris, Private Lives with Kim Cattrall, Broadway, London, film, big screen and small, um, and now here at CFT, The Pajama Game. Now, one of the things that I was noticing, I was reading this wonderful book, National Service, um, when Richard Eyre was the director and it's about his time there. And there is an entry um, for the 1st of December 1992. And it's about um, a play called Carousel that we will know that is being directed by Nicholas Heitner. And this is what Richard says. The show is wonderful but is helped in particular by Joanna Riding, who is real in a way no other musical performer I've ever seen is. She stops it feeling like a musical and it makes it just perfect. Now, Joanna Riding, of course, is playing the lead for us here in the pajama game. So, Richard, I just, um, I read the program. There's a wonderful program note. And you talk about the pajama game being the very first musical you didn't actually see but heard. Do you just want to talk a little bit about why this particular show is so important to you? Um, I, know, I never went to the theatre as a child. I, I grew up in Dorset. Um, which, uh, as you may know, is a county um, significant for its total lack of theatre. <laughs> um, and um, in the middle of, of really the most beautiful countryside in, in England, and my father was a naval officer and then he retired young and he became a, a farmer. He had no interest in the theatre. My mother um, also had no interest in the theatre and they weren't readers, they, they had really no curiosity about the arts. And my sister and I, my sister's a very good, draws very well, and became a landscape architect. We used to think we were changelings as, as children because it somehow had nothing to do with uh, our parents. And from a young age, we were both very interested in the arts. Anyway, I never went to the theatre until... I was 16 and I went to, to the Bristol Old Vic and I saw a production of Hamlet, a play that I'd never read uh, and had barely heard of, with an actor I'd never heard of called Peter O'Toole. <laughs> um, Peter O'Toole was then dark haired, uh, curly dark hair, and he had a Roman nose. He was absolutely incredible. And I was completely capsized by the by Hamlet. Um, I, I thought this was a world of imagination opened up and, and the power of theatre became apparent to me. Meanwhile, my um, contact with the theatre was only through my sister's record collection. And she had, um, she was that much older than me and was interested in Broadway musicals. So she had a uh, pyjama game, Guys and Dolls, West Side Story, My Fair Lady, and a pyjama game, somehow, um, I think because it, of, of all those musicals, it's probably the, the musically the simplest, but it really stuck to the extent that I had the score. Uh, I could have gone from beginning to end and, and sung the score of, of pyjama game, and I'd always... Uh, in, had lurked a desire to do it, and I'd mentioned it occasionally, and never find anyone who was 
very interested in my proposition of putting on a production of The Pajama Game until I was talking to Jonathan uh, uh, about four or five years ago, maybe not so long after he took over, and I said, there's this musical, nobody likes it, <laughs> um, but I do, uh, and I've never seen it, uh, and there was a terrible movie with Doris Day, but I think it's great, and I think um, it would be wonderful to do it uh, at Chichester, and he said, fine, let's do it. Um, but it took a long time because yeah. I then got involved in other things. Anyway, happily, now we are doing it with um, a cast that actually couldn't be bettered. So it, it all, some things are meant to happen when they happen. So y you, you didn't see um, either the Broadway revival or the London revival, because there was quite a recent um, Broadway and London revivals, yeah. weren't there? there you, was, so you've never seen it? I've, I've never seen it. Really? Um, no, it was revived on Broadway with Harry Connick. Mm. And it was sort of customised to suit Harry Connick, who apparently was rather good. But in Hernando's Hideaway, which in my version is a kind of um, extreme parody of a, a kind of Midwestern Mexican fantasy bar, was a sort of piano club where, would you believe it, Harry Connick played the piano. <laughs> um, and, um, and it was so, it, it, it wasn't the truth of the story. I mean, good musicals have a sort of truth about them, uh, an, an emotional truth. And I know that they're, they're sentimental and people, sentimental is a word that people generally use in a pejorative sense. I think it's admirable because I think it's, you know, you're talking about feeling. If the feelings are real, if they're not fake feelings, then it's, it's touching. It may be, there may be sentiment, but it's not, uh, not kitschy. And, and I think there is this relationship, the center of, of, uh, um, of this musical, which is true and rather well observed. Uh, and it also is about a world of working people who aren't glamorized and they're not sentimentalized and and also the musical doesn't break faith with them they actually win their strike and the um bus turns out to be corrupt which is very very satisfying <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no i hadn't seen it before and i didn't see there was a production done uh, in 1999 by simon callow and um for an inexplicable reason they decided to get the, the painter, American painter, Frank Stella, to design the set. Now, Frank Stella, you may know his work, a modernist painter, abstract painter, um, who, as far as I know, has, had never designed for the theater. I don't know if he'd even been to a <laughs> theater. <laughs> but anyway. from Dorset, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, um, he designed it and, um, uh, people say it was a bit of a road crash. So um, it's not a musical that you know people uh, nurture as oh we must have another revival. But but interestingly enough, um, many of the songs are independently known outside of it, aren't they? You know they were recorded, they went into the charts. Yeah, and and they're sort of there in in our cultural DNA, and the audiences every night. You can see them go, oh, I didn't know that was in there. Uh, and there's that sort of murmur of satisfaction and you kind of feel, oh, I know this is somehow in the, in the cultural compost and that's it goes, been laid And it up. goes much younger even than you'd imagine because I was humming Steam Heat in a way. I have not got a very good voice. And then my daughter picked it up, who's 23 and was singing along. And I said, that's in the show we're going to see on Monday. And she went, really? And so she That's knew it, really totally, and she's 23, um, you know, and so it's not just that people know the Hey You or, yeah. you know, you know it's, yeah. they, they've, they've been set free almost, yeah. which is always a sign. Um, just going back to what you were saying about the story, um, I, I sort of knew that it was set in a pyjama factory. I knew it was 50s, I knew it was labour and strikes. But what I thought was so refreshing and very modern about it was that although you've got the, the girl meets boy and they're on the wrong side of the battle, um, as it were. The lead character, played by Joanna Rinding Babe, 
is, I mean, she's the union organiser. And it's actually a very modern story. I mean, it's, it's a very equal male and female cast, and that's why I think some of the numbers are so wonderful. Yes, it's, um, I'm afraid to say that I, I'm always appalled by the figures about uh, women in, in positions of power and women in, in boardroom. And, uh, the, uh, and this extraordinary, tiresome thing of every time um, a woman is asked, are you a feminist? Uh, I'm a woman, you know, that seems to be enough and the implication should be, so I expect to be treated uh, with the same respect and, and equality as, as men, which doesn't happen in the workplace. And it, this is, um, you could, you know, say this is a sort of feminist text in the sense that there is a very, very strong woman who absolutely won't uh, have anything but uh, things happening on her terms. And her terms are, in my view, that she's just respected. Um, and she has her mind, he has uh, his mind. Um, and, it's, and she states her position very, very strongly. And it happens to be one with which I agree. She has a very eloquent speech in the second half where she's talking about the need to be a member of a team. And, and, and it, it, what I extrapolate from that is what always distressed me about um, the age of Thatcher is this notion there is no such thing as society. And I've always felt very, very strongly that there is such a thing as society. And one of the reasons that I like working in a theatre and working with a group of people is that it's a living demonstration of a society that actually works. You have a group of people united with a common aim, common purposes, and they uh, unite for a purpose which is to um, entertain a, an audience. That seems to me a virtuous circle. And one of the things that um, always strikes me about musicals, you know, you've explained how you mentioned it to Jonathan Church and everybody else had gone, oh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't fancy that. And he went, yes. But presumably the, the next thing that really matters is that team. And you have terrifically strong leads, um, you know, at the centre of the play. But also you've got Stephen Meir as a choreographer, you've got the wonderful Gareth Valentine, who are very well known to Chichester audiences. Do you think that that is the very beginning of how your idea of how to do it comes from, that putting all the people together. I, I do, and that's, um, I mean, to go back to the analogy of, of creating a society that works, um, it's, I, I, I'd say that's a very strong reason why I like working in the theatre. And people say, oh, it's surrogate family. Um, I come from a family that wasn't a model society. Um, <laughs> It was completely dysfunctional. Um, so a part of me does, I can see, longs for a family that works. Um, the difference is, of course, that you can't choose the members of your own family, but you can choose the member of, members of your theatrical ah, family. Ah, director is God, yes. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I like to work with people I like and admire. And... Stephen Meir and Gareth Valentine and the designer uh, Tim Hatley and Howard Harrison, um, the lighting designer, and Paul Grutius, the, um, the sound designer, are all friends. They're sort of part of, uh, you know, I've worked with them all uh, many times. So immediately you have a sort of community of, of common interest and then get together. The, the casting of, of Joe Riding and uh, Hadley Fraser was absolutely crucial. And it's like, it is like casting a Shakespeare play. I'm always appalled when people say, oh, I'm going to do a production of As You Like It. And they, you say, well, who's going to play Rosalind and Orlando? And they say, I don't know, we haven't cast it yet. <laughs> I think, well, you can't, you can't actually do it. You can't do those plays, and that's true of of most musicals, that they depend, the spine of it, of musicals, is always a love story. Um, that's absolutely invariable. And uh, you have to know who those partners are. Because they, together, um, you know, uh, we were saying just before we came on, the joy of it is, for those of you who have not yet seen it, that 
it could be on a massive stage, <coughs> but there is a wonderful intimacy about it in here, particularly because you can see Hadley Fraser and Joe Riding's expressions all the time, and it is so funny. And I think, I don't know, but maybe that would be lost in a bigger space. I mean, it, it really, the audience was so engaged with it. I mean, were you consciously saying, make this the comedy at the heart of it, or does it just naturally come out because of the way they play the parts? Uh, I think it naturally comes out. I don't, don't, I don't sort of categorise things in that way. Um, I encourage people to be, to examine their lives in the play. So to me, it's very important that everybody in every scene has a life, has an identity, has, uh, can occupy the space. And that I like to be able to look at a stage. It's one of the reasons that uh, theatre is so strong. It's not doing what film does. Film says, you've got to look there. You've got to look there. You know, the, here is a, a, a wide shot, but I'm moving there to a close-up. Whereas theatre, um, I can decide, you know, the, the, it starts in the, on the factory floor and there are nine sewing machines and people working at sewing machines. And sometimes I think, well, I'll just watch that character tonight because uh, I'm fascinated and they've got a, a, a life and uh, I'm going to see where that life goes. And it's very satisfying for me, but I think, I hope, it's very satisfying for the actors because it means that they're not, they're not in sort of hierarchical relationship to... I, I remember a friend of mine was once in a production of uh, Pygmalion. This was uh, Bob Hoskins. And, and Diana Rigg, who was then a big star, um, was playing Eliza Doolittle, and Bob was playing uh, Doolittle. And uh, Bob, I, I said, what's it like? He said, well, I, I never get to the centre of the stage. <laughs> and I said, why, why is that, Bob? He said, well, because I'm beneath the title. So, <laughs> and, you know, that, and you used to see a lot more of that sort of hierarchical staging where the star was sort of at the centre. And, and it was sort of like in, interest um, was sort of proportionately smaller the further you got away, you, away from the sun at the, at the centre. And I find that incredibly frustrating and very dull in a piece of theatre. But is it different? I mean, you know this theatre. Uh, you know, you, the last cigarette w w w w was the last time you were here. Um, and so you know the shape and the size of it. Does that influence enormously how you start to put it together? But, you know, because you know the audience is very close and they're all the way round. Yes, uh, there's some good things. I mean, all the way round, you see. I'm, I'm neglecting you. But, but that's one of the things that I keep saying to the actors. Look, there are people the pe people sitting at the side and they never get to see your eyes. Um, so it, it is important. But the good thing about putting on a play here, putting on a musical here, is that you start off by saying, there's no scenery. You know, I mean, yes, there's scenery. But I said, you know, when I first started working with Tim Hatley on this, we said, well, you know, we've got to create a factory. We've got to create a picnic, we've got to create these worlds, but we're going to do it all with objects that can be taken out and we've got to find a framework for it. And so you're never troubled by that thing that you so often have if you've got flying and um, with musicals of the temptation to put a lot of scenery on stage. You just can't do it here. You can't put scenery. You can't fly anything except those lamps because there's only about uh, 10 feet above there. Um, and uh, that's emancipating because it means you have to find uh, a, a style that is very, very fluid. And I, I always think musicals are like films in the sense that you have to have the facility to be able to cut from one place to another without sitting there with dead time while loads of scenery is being trucked around. And I love the fact that it's, it's fluent and it's fluid and that the actors, in fact, change the space. And, and actually, watching it, I mean, it is astonishingly engaging for that reason, that there is always something moving. 
but it, it, it felt, I mean, I was just so disappointed when it had finished, actually, you know, because there was that sense of momentum all the way through, um, even when it was two people on the stage singing a love song. You know, it felt that there was an energy moving it, it forward all the way through. When you were, um, you know, we, we've obviously, there have been big and small musicals here, um, but when you start to put a musical together, this is probably going to be a ludicrously stupid question. Do you start, just start at the beginning? Or do you pick out certain numbers that are, involve more of the company and everybody will, so do you, know, do, do you actually break it up into sections um, or do you just, you know? No, you break it up into sections. Um, I mean, there's, there's, whether you're talking about how you develop it when you're working with a designer, that sort of, you have certain images, um, and I had an image of, of the shop floor and, and the, the sewing, the machines. I knew that had to be there. Um, I had a sort of idea of what uh, uh, Hernando's hideaway was like. Um, and, and I knew that, you know, I wanted this space. So it, it's sort of, I don't know if you do, if you did chemistry at school, but if you, if you remember growing a copper sulfate crystal, which a copper sulfate is absolutely beautiful, blue, sort of aquamarine color. And what you do, and it's sort of, you do it early stages of, of chemistry, you dip a piece of um, string or a, a thread um, with something on it uh, into a saturated solution of copper sulfate. And gradually this exquisite crystal forms around it and then you can lift it out and you've got this jewel, multifaceted jewel of a, a copper sulfate crystal. And that would be, that's my metaphor for how you work on a production. You, you saturate your mind with references. So Tim and I would sit around with references, photo books from the, the 50s, films, posters, everything, uh, and talk about it and saturate our minds with the period and the show. And then gradually things form around one or two core images. And is and that, that the same for a piece of theatre as opposed to an opera, as opposed to a, mu yeah. a piece of music theatre? Is it the same process regardless of actually what you're working yes, on? Yes, it, it, it is. It, it's, how, how? it's identical. Um, I mean, the, I, I did a play recently at the Almeida Theatre in, in London. Um, again, no scenery. I, I find the older I get, the more resentful I am of, <laughs> of scenery. Um, and I had, the play was called The Dark Earth and the Light Sky. And I said to Bob Crowley, who was the designer, I said, I just know that it's got to have dark earth, real soil on the stage and a, a sky around the back. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but that's, uh, that's got to be, you, you, that's what you have to design. And then, we serve that, and I find a way of staging the scenes, and eventually we, we had virtually no furniture and just found a way by applying our own rules to the staging of it. The thing that I really, uh, really noticed um, when, I, when I saw the pyjama game a couple of days ago was that not only, as, as you've said, is the design exquisite, the choreography exquisite, the music and the blending of the voices, and the acting, so everything is sort of a star. But the company, all of them, looked like they were having a blast. It, has it been a very happy experience? It, I mean, that came across to the audience, and it doesn't um, always. Well, yeah, I, I, think, I think so. Um, <laughs> is there um, a member of the cast here? No, no, no. And if, if not, they're the most brilliant actors. Well. <laughs> uh, because they give the impression of having the most yeah. Wonderful time. I mean, I, I've just loved this. I haven't had so much fun legally for <laughs> a, a very long time. You have to ask, there's, there's some at the cast there. Yeah, we're having a fun at the cast. So. But you know, I yeah. mean, I, I think there is something, particularly in the musical um, of, of this nature, where the sense of joy 
matters a great deal. Um, regardless of, you know, a lot of people will come in knowing the story and having, you know, certain songs in their minds and other people will, will not. But they will leave, I have no doubt, with massive smiles on their faces. Um, and that's, you know, that I, is... I think <laughs> that's an important element in theatre, is, is a sense of joy, whether it be Othello or whether it be the pyjama game or Hamlet or, or even... Uh, an opera, I've got sort of more into doing operas recently. Um, it's just the sense of, of joy. It's such a privilege to do what we do and be able to, to, I mean, it's so rare to be paid for what you enjoy doing and to, you know, and to be praised for what you enjoy doing. It's such a sort of extravagant um, privilege. And, you know, I mean, you as a wonderful writer know that privilege that <laughs> um, yes yes but but the absolutely the downside not I hate that phrase um the other side of that is you know uh, Anita Bruckner once said to me you know she just and it was just after she'd won the Booker Prize so suddenly there was a lot of attention on her and I said you know it must be wonderful now waiting for your next book to come out after you know all these years and you've won the Booker Prize and she said I feel like checking myself into an asylum. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, the, it's that strange thing, that, that thing of each piece is a new sense of being flayed alive. It is true that I sort of, here am I, I've been directing for 45 years and I find myself resenting the fact I'm nervous about Monday night where we get the press in. Ah. And I think, you know, they've got to be judged and I just want them to love it as much yeah. as I love it and I will be hurt yeah, if yeah, they don't. Yeah. And, I mean, there's, there's a wonderful thing that, that uh, Garrison Keillor said about critics. He said the trouble is with all of us that the only review we ever feel satisfied with is the review that starts, Hail, O Sun God, we salute you as our leader. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's uncomfortably true that we want unqualified praise. But when you get unqualified praise, I mean, I think most of us feel, you know, you, I don't read, you know, you don't gloat over it. You just think, OK, OK, fine. And you think, oh, that's a bit excessive. Yes, and you but, think they're a fool, yeah, you know, for you liking think, it. Oh, but so that part of it, I find difficult and that's the cycle. Do you read your reviews as the director so that you are aware of what's being said on behalf of your actors as it were or do you just not go near them until the paint has dried? As it um, were? I sort of, I kind of scan them and you know you can't, there's always someone who says oh I'm so sorry about that review in the Telegraph yes. and you <laughs> haven't read it. And, yeah. You think, and they're quite wrong about your production. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've so, discovered that uh, things are not as bad. Bad reviews, I find, are not as bad if you read them on a computer. Somehow, when it's in yes. a, on a piece of paper. So I, when I know there's something that's awful about my, one of my books lurking out there, I think if I just sort of look at it on the computer, it doesn't really count. Yes. And it's all right. It's like, it's yeah. like blogging. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's not a real world, that one, is it? No. Um, we, of course, as usual, um, must give the house back to the players quite soon. Um, but we have got five minutes, and I promised that I would let some questions, because I know people here like to ask questions. Right. Um, can I ask you, are there any restrictions on your creativity by the rights holders? And does it represent that <coughs> the rights holders come to see the production? Um, the rights of Pajama Game are owned by a company called Music Theatre International. That company is now owned by Cameron McIntosh, who is a, a very old friend of mine. Um, the, the restrictions are that you get... I have a script um, that is of the Broadway production. Um, I wouldn't say what you're seeing is exactly that script. And I have moved things around a bit. Um, and there are lines that you won't recognise from that script. So um, I don't think I've been cavalier with the Broadway version. But, um, you know, I couldn't, I can't just sort of, uh, nor would I want to, ignore it. Um, if, you know, if I started changing lyrics, I would think, 
um, this is extremely dangerous and that the rights holders would immediately blow the legal whistle. So it's, I, I would say, for interpretation. And, um, you know, the, the liberties I've taken, I, I would happily defend to uh, the owner of the rights, Sir Cameron McIntosh. <laughs> Thank you. Gentleman next door, then Edna. I've seen the musical now three times, so um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, you're in for a real treat. And do uh, get the uh, do get back to the box office and get the last few tickets. You want to come see it again. Um, in seeing it three times as a member of the public, I've been able to do some of the things that you were suggesting earlier. That you look on different characters and what they're doing. And I was I was thinking yes, reflecting yesterday about authenticity and. Uh, the pursuit of period authenticity, because the, the musical set in 1954. So I was wondering if you could say something a bit about um, how important is that for you? It's not just you as the director, but it's the whole company being authentic in what they're presenting to the public. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, well, you know, it's no secret. I was uh, 11 in 1954, so yes, I can remember it. And if something is wrong in the costumes, I'll say, I just feel... I mean, I wasn't living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 1954. I was living in a small village in Dorset. So, uh, but, you know, you have a sense of whether things are right and wrong. And I was obsessed as a teenager by American culture. So in the late 50s, I was completely submerged in American culture. And, and I read comics, listened exclusively to... Uh, American music watched exclusively, more or less exclusively, watched American films and, if I could, American television. So I know, you know, I, I do know the period at first hand, apart from looking at an awful lot of, of reference books. So I would say occasionally to, uh, that's, that's just, it, you know, it doesn't seem to me right. That's, that's an attitude that is, you know, you're, you're taking from, you know, the, the the contemporary world, and um, not often, but, but occasionally, yeah. I'm very intrigued to know how a, a sort of culturally deprived 16-year-old from Dorset <coughs> got to the top job. I mean, what happened in between? <coughs> uh, that, that might take quite a long time to answer. <laughs> I, it's, it's, that's quite hard. I, w I did... I did go to... I was the first in my family to go to university. Um, and uh, I went to read physics and maths at, uh, at Cambridge. As soon as I got there, I realised I was a complete fraud because anyone knows anything about maths knows that if you can't do it, I would got to a point that it's like with a musical instrument. I knew I couldn't get to the next stage. So uh, when they'd given me a place, I said, Look, I'm sorry, I can't do it. It happened that they just employed an English lecturer called Kingsley Amis, the novelist, <laughs> as an English supervisor at my college, and they didn't have any students for him. <laughs> so they said to me, would you like to read English? And I said, yes, absolutely. And so I read English, and practically not having read, you know, the, the great novels, and, 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 and he loved it. He was a wonderful teacher because he could just... I was an empty slate. I got interested that in, in the theatre there, um, and long story short, I became an actor when I left university. I wasn't a good enough actor ever to satisfy myself. I was actually in a musical, and I got members of my company together, and I said, would we do a Sunday night production? We did the Sunday night production. It happened that in the audience was John Neville, the director, and Judy Dench. Um, and John offered me a job on the basis of this. And then I, I um, got offered other jobs and I became a director. And the director of the theatre that I was in doing the musical sort of adopted me as his um, artistic assistant. And, and when people talk of luck, the luck is having a patron, having somebody who takes an interest in you at a critical time in your life and says, you know, you can really do something. And this hadn't happened to me before, and it completely changed my life. 
That's how it happened. Well, that, was, that was a very brilliant digest, <laughs> quickly. For that. Um, we've got to stop because obviously the actors will need to warm up. Um, but I want to just ask one final question. Back to that bedroom in Dorset, which we're all now imagining. You listening, 11 years old, sitting cross-legged on the floor, whatever, listening to that music. You've never seen it, and now here you are. Does it feel how you thought it would? I had a sort of strange... If I thought about it, I thought... How, how odd that the whole musical, that they wear pyjamas throughout. <laughs> and it was only when I sort of came back to it that I realised that the pyjamas only appeared in the finale. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of... It, it kind of chimes with what was in my imagination. And I'm very pleased that I haven't ever seen it before because it means that, for me, I'm in a constant state of enchantment when I watch this. And I think everybody who has seen it or will see it will uh, feel the same. It is an extraordinary thing to have such an extraordinarily and a peerless cast across every role, actually, and the design, everything fitting together, and the most incredible start to the season. Um, there will be an afterwards performance, um, a post-performance talk, on the 20th of May, where members of the, car, the company will come and talk. You don't have to have been into the show that night, but you do have to get yourself a ticket and, and come in. It's free as well, and it will be about 40 minutes chatting afterwards. Um, the next pre-show talk um, that I'll be doing is on the 19th of June, and that will be with David Edgar about his new play, If Only, uh, which is a new political play. Um, but for now, it just remains for me to say an enormous thank you to the wonderful Sir Richard Eyre. <laughs>